we'll all hail the Lamb, and this is one we know well. All hail the Lamb, enthroned on high, his praise shall be our battle cry. This is a lovely one to start with, so sing it out this morning. proclaims it, for by his power each tree and flower was planned and made. This makes it more personal. A wonderful Savior is Jesus, my Lord, a wonderful Savior to me. If you're down in the doldrums this morning, you're struggling with your spiritual life or you're struggling physically or mentally, just think about these words 
as we sing them together, and I hope they will warm your heart. <laughs>
Let's sing the next one, Our Deep the Father's Love for Us. We'll sing just the first two verses of this hymn, just the first two. for a moment. Father, we thank you for your great heart of love toward each one of us. We thank you for the privilege of singing together your praise. We thank you for the opportunity to meet on another new Lord's Day morning. Father, would you meet with us and would you bless us and do us good this day? We ask it all in the sea of your name. Amen. Let's sing our opening hymn of praise Jesus, the name high over all in hell or earth or sky. We'll stand after the introduction.
Just before Mark comes to make the announcements, let's bow our hearts together in prayer. <clears throat> our God and our Father, we thank you on another new Lord's Day morning that we're able to gather together like this in the house of God. We thank you that we're able to lift our hearts to you in worship and in praise. We acknowledge, our Father, that you are a great God and a God of great grace and a God who has been so faithful to each one of us in the week that has gone out into eternity. Father, we thank you whatever this past week has brought into our lives or into our homes. We thank you that we have been conscious of your presence with us. We can say every day, the words of the psalmist who says, I will lift up mine eyes onto the hills, from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord. And Father, we thank you that as we meet together this morning and as we come apart from a world of trouble and turmoil, that we can look heavenward to a God who sits enthroned upon the universe one who created all things, one who sustains all things by the word of his power. Father, we come to you this morning in the name of your Son, our precious Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you that you sent him into the world to be our Savior. Thank you, Father, for that place called Calvary. Thank you for that cross which was erected there on Golgotha's hillside where the Lord Jesus Christ suffered and bled and died for our sins. Thank you, Father, that many of us have come to know him as our Savior. We have come in the only way that we could have come, and that was as a sinner to the foot of the cross. And yet we knew that the Lord Jesus Christ had done everything necessary for us to be saved. We simply came to him in repentance and in faith, and said, I do believe, I will believe that Jesus died for me. And today we rejoice in the knowledge of sins forgiven. We thank you, Father, for your marvelous grace that has wrought this miracle of grace in our lives. And we come to you on another morning, Father, to worship you, to praise you, and to magnify your great name. Thank you for all those who have been able to gather with us here in the building and those who are joining us live on Facebook. Father, we thank you for every head bowed in your presence just now. Would you draw near to us and would you bless us, our Father, this day? You know the week that each one of us have come through. You know who we are and where we are on the pathway of life just now. For some, this past week might have been difficult. For others, our Father, they may be coping with personal issues that are peculiar to them alone. But our Father, we thank you that as we come before your throne of grace, there is grace in all its abundance to help us in these difficult times. Father, bless us, we pray. Bless all that will take part. We pray, our Father, that as a result of us coming together, that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ will be magnified in the midst of his people. We do remember our Father today, those who would love to be with us, but yet they cannot be here for various reasons. We commend to you those who are laid aside, those who are in hospital, those who are covering at home, those, our Father, who at this moment are on well, and there are so, so many of them. 
but we commend them to your gracious care. Ask our Father that you'll watch over them. Pray that you'll guide those who attend them. And we pray, our Father, that it won't be long until they're back home again with their families and those who are at home, that it won't be long till they're back amongst us rejoicing in the goodness of God toward them. Father, bless everywhere else where your word will be preached this day and use it for the good of your people and for the salvation of souls. Remember Woody and Elaine in the States just now. Remember Letitia, our father in Romania. We pray for Colin and Carl and for Philip. We pray for Eddie and for Tanya as they head out this week, our father, to Fatima. And we ask that you'll watch over them, take them safely, and use them there for a people in such great need. So, Father, we thank you for the privilege of being here this morning. Bless us now, we humbly pray, and grant, O God, that in all things the name of our Lord Jesus Christ will be exalted, and we ask it all for his glory and in his precious name. Amen. Mark's going to come and make the necessary announcements. Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Can I give you all a warm welcome to our ministry and breaking of bread service at Bambridge Baptist Church. We welcome those who will be tuning in live on Facebook and if you're visiting with us. May we know the blessing of the Lord as we fellowship and worship in the Lord's presence this morning. After ministry of God's word, we meet around the Lord's table to remember our Lord Jesus Christ as he has commanded us to do. If you're saved and walking in fellowship with the Lord, we invite you to remain behind as we break bread together. Children's talk this morning will be Zara Guinness. The children's crash our church will be Donna Atchison and Maureen Irvine. And the children's crash will be Julie Bird, Aaron and Sarah Bowman. Then this evening our prayer meeting at 5.45 preceding the service at 6.30 p.m. Pastor Jeffrey Ward will be our visiting speaker this evening and the singers will be Heavenly Sunshine. Youth Fellowship after service tonight at 8 p.m. through to 9 p.m. and the pickup for the young people will be 9.15. The announcements for the week. Monday, the warm room recommences at 10.30 a.m. in the church hall. If you know anyone that could avail of this, if you please take the opportunity to invite them along. Just prior notice to the ladies, the craft class will recommence on Monday the 14th and that's at 7.30 p.m. and all ladies will be welcome to that. Then on Tuesday, the toddler group at 10.30 a.m. Fellowship hour on two, at 2.30 p.m. And the speaker will be our own Pastor Taylor. Uh, the Good News Club at 6.45 p.m. And then at 7.30 p.m. there will be an elders meeting and the deacons will join them at 8.30. Then on Wednesday, our prayer meeting and Bible study at 8 p.m. And Pastor Taylor will be speaking on the prophecy of Joel. Then on Friday evening, the youth club at 7.30 p.m., and that's for all year at the year 12 young people. Next Lord's Day, Sunday school and Bible class at 10 a.m. in the church hall. Church service is running at the usual times of 11.30 and 6.30, and Pastor Taylor will be speaking at both services. Children's talk next week will be Beverly. Children's church will be Timothy and Caroline Carson, and the children's crash will be Jennifer Russell, Selena Fairburn, and Jill Guinness. So I did mention last week about the leaflets for the Siemens Christian Friends Society. They are now in the hall. And if you would like to help and donate, if you could please lift your leaflet in the hall on the way out. The wee leaflet gives you a list of all the items uh, that they're looking for. So if you take away your list and bring back all your items by the 27th of October. And that's from Stephen Gamble. Pastor Taylor has spoken with our caretakers, Stephen and Isla Brown. And we are aware that they'll be standing down in March 2025. So if anyone is interested in the role of caretaker, if you could please speak to our elder, Kenneth Atchison, regarding that. Just one letter to read out. Dear pastor, members and friends of Bambridge Baptist Church, just a note to thank all those who prayed for my father during his recent illness. Also to thank all those who attended his funeral, sent cards and messages of sympathy. It was all very much appreciated. It is great to know that Daddy is out of his suffering and with his Saviour, whom he loved 
and served. And that's from Joan, Colin, Jody, and Cherith. And then a wee verse at the end. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Philippians 1 and 21. That's all the announcements on the red subject as always in the will of the Lord. We're going to ask Sarah now to come and bring the children's talk. And if all the children would please make their way up to the front. Thank you very much. Everyone. It's so good to see you all out. Um, so, today, so today I have something with me. I'm sure a lot of you know what it is. Can anyone just quickly tell me what this is? Yeah, a bag. And who here takes a bag to school? Oh, you all do. You all do. So I also take this bag uh, with me. And as you can tell, um, it's just one over there. But maybe some of your school bags are very light or maybe some of them are heavy. Can you just put your hands up and guess? Who thinks this bag is heavy? And who thinks this bag is light? Okay. Ooh, we've got one who thinks it's light. Well, I'm going to ask someone to come up and they're going to tell me, Joshua, would you come up and would you try lift this bag and would you tell everyone if, if it's heavy or if it's light? Heavy. Heavy, very heavy. I'm glad you said that. Well, Joshua, it's not just you who thinks it's very heavy. I think it's also very heavy. Now this is my, I won't say school bag because I don't go to school anymore, but this is my rucksack and I carry it to class every day. And if you look inside, it is full of books. For all that studying I do, <laughs> not much of it goes on, but it is full of books. And I carry this every day and you know what? The bag is so heavy and my shoulders get so, so sore. And on my walk, all I think about is I just wish someone would come and carry it for me. And you know what, boys and girls, the relief when I get home, when I get home and I take my bag off, I feel so, so much better. I can move around again without all that weight. And I, my shoulders aren't sore anymore. And I am just so thankful to be home and not have to carry that bag anymore. So boys and girls, sometimes in life we have things that make us feel a bit heavy, that are heavy not on our shoulders, but in our hearts. And these can be things like how, when we feel sad, when we feel worried, or when we feel upset. And this might be when, you, you know, when you're in school and your friends aren't, aren't being nice to you, or there's trouble at home, or maybe you have a lot of homework and you're very, very worried about it. And these are all things that make our hearts feel a bit heavy or may make them feel a little hurt. And you know what, boys and girls, in the Bible it tells us that if Jesus, in the Bible it tells us that Jesus says if we feel like we are carrying a lot of things in our heart, that we can come to him and we won't have to carry it all by ourselves, just like I had to carry that bag all by myself. And he says this, he says this in Matthew chapter 11 and verse 28. And in Matthew 11 it says, Come to me, all you who labour and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And when Jesus says this, this means that he wants to help us. And when he says, come to me, he wants you to talk about the things that make us feel heavy and make us feel tired. And when we come to him, we will find rest. That just means when we come to him and we talk about these things, we can feel comfort and we can feel peace about our worries. And it just means we won't have to carry these things all by ourselves. Jesus wants to listen to our problems because he loves us so, so much. And Jesus loved us so much, not only does he listen to our problems, but he loved us so much that he died for us. He died for us so we could be forgiven for all the bad things we do that are called sin. And he died on the cross at Calvary. And if we ask Jesus to forgive our sins, he will. If we believe we've, we've done wrong, and be asked for forgiveness, we can be in, with him in heaven. When we die, that is. And in heaven, our hearts will never ever feel heavy or feel hurt because there is no sadness and there is no worry or fear. And you know what, boys and girls, just like when I took my bag off and I felt much, much better, if we tell our burdens and we tell our worries to Jesus, he will also help us, we will feel better. He wants to carry them for us just because he loves us. 
And do you know what? Jesus understands the things you're going through because he once lived as a human. He came down as a baby and he lived a human life and then died on the cross. So he knows what we're going through. But how can we give our worries to Jesus? Well, we can pray and we can tell him what is bothering us and just what's on our hearts, what's, what's annoying us. And we can trust because he loves us so much that he will help us. So next time you feel down or you feel a bit worried or sad, remember, you don't have to carry your problems all by yourself, just like I have to carry the bag by myself. Because Jesus is always there and he wants to help you carry them. And any worries you can, any worries you have, he will give you that com comfort if you ask for his help. Thank you. You can just head out to Children's Church for Crash. Let's sing a lovely chorus together, and then the children can leave. Love, love, boundless and free. Thank you, Zara. Let's sing this together. I think they're all gone, but I'm going to sing it anyway. Not by myself, but with you as well. Love, love, L-O-V. I'll let you sit like the children. If you behave yourselves, I will sing it through. Okay. Love, love, L-O-V, love, love, boundless and free. Jesus sent heaven to die on the tree. This was love, love, love. Dun, dun, D-O-N-E. Turn with me, please, to the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2. The Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2. We're going to read from verse 1. <clears throat> Let's just pray for a moment. Father, as we turn to your word just now and we come to meditate upon it. We do pray, our Father, that through your word you will speak to us. We thank you for reminding us through Zara today that we're carrying with us all the weight of the world upon our shoulders, that you care and you will help us to bear the burden. Father, as we come to your word, we thank you that we have it in our own language. We pray, Father, that you'll open up your word to our gaze this morning, and we pray that you'll speak to us through your word. Father, as we follow these verses before us in this book that we're studying together, there's so much for us to consider individually and collectively. So we humbly pray as we read your word and meditate upon it that you would use it for our good today and in days to come. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's read Acts chapter 2, verse 1. It says, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit 
gave them utterance. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded or troubled in their minds because that every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and the dwellers in Mesopotamia and in Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia in Egypt and in the parts of Libya about Cyrene, strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. And they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, What meaneth this? Others mocking said, These men are full of new wine. Amen. God will add his blessing to this reading from his word. You may remember that last Sunday morning as we looked at the disciples together that they were preparing themselves for the days ahead. That's because the disciples had already watched as the Lord Jesus Christ ascended back to heaven from their midst and they knew now that they were facing a future without him. There would no longer be this physical nearness for Jesus had gone, but there would be a spiritual presence for he promised them that they were to wait until the Spirit of God would be bestowed upon them. We watched them as they waited and the first thing we noted was their support of each other. They met in the upper room. They continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the woman and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. And from the earliest days, there is no doubt that these people, these early Christians, they all had all things in common. And there they are, standing alongside each other, supporting each other, enjoying each other's fellowship, and they were of one mind and one purpose. We noted, secondly, their steadfastness in prayer. They all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication. The word continued just simply means they persevered in prayer. And prayer was, of course, necessary for them because they were praying with each other and for each other. They had a commission to fulfill and they couldn't do it without prayer. And if they were going to see anything accomplished, it must be done with prayer. And then we notice their selection of an apostle because Judas Iscariot is no longer with them. We know what happened to him. But here we discover that they had to pick another man to take Judas's place. And the qualifications for that role were very clear. The one who would replace Judas must have been a companion of the Lord Jesus Christ from the time when John the Baptist was active right up until the time of the ascension of Christ. And in particular, Peter emphasized he must be a witness of the resurrection. And of course, two men were suitable. They were Joseph and Matthias. They cast lots. They prayed to God for his will. And Matthias was chosen as the replacement for Judas Iscariot. Now this morning, we come here to the verses we've read in Acts chapter 2. And we're coming to the day of Pentecost. And what a miraculous day the day of Pentecost was not only in the lives of the disciples themselves who had been meeting together, praying together, and longing for the advent of the Holy Spirit, but also in the lives of all those who were gathered in Jerusalem that day. They were there to celebrate the feast and they were to experience something wonderful in their own lives. And it's important, therefore, that you and I understand the significance of what we refer to as the day 
of Pentecost. It was a great day. But I want, first of all, this morning to remind you of the meaning of Pentecost. You see, the day of Pentecost was a remarkable event. You cannot doubt that in any way. And all that happened in that day was one of the most important days in the history of the Christian church because we discover on this particular day that some 3,000 people were saved. Can you imagine that? We sit in prayer meetings and we often say when we pray, Lord, if there's any unsaved people out today, speak to them. That's not faith. You and I should be going out to bring them in so that they're sitting here under the sound of the glorious gospel, a gospel that alone can save them from their sin. On this day at Pentecost, 3,000 people came to know the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior, as the Spirit of God moved amongst them. This was the day, of course, that Jesus had already spoken about to the disciples when he spoke about the fulfillment of a promise. But in order to put this into context, let me seek to remind you of two important things. First of all, we need to understand what the day of Pentecost was. Luke says, when the day of Pentecost was fully come. If you look at the Jewish mind, you'll understand that this was a big day, a very important day in the Jewish calendar. According to the Mosaic law, there were three great Jewish festivals to which every male uh, living within a 20-mile radius of Jerusalem was legally bound to attend. You say to me, I don't believe in legalism. I want my freedom. And yes, we are saved, and in Christ there is liberty to be enjoyed. But you go back to these days, and here were men who lived within a 20-mile radius of Jerusalem, and they were legally bound to attend these three annual feasts. They were the Passover, Pentecost, and the Feast of Tabernacles. If I asked you this morning, do you understand what those three feasts actually mean? You might say to me, no, I know about this or that or the other thing. Well, let me very quickly tell you the Passover. This was associated with the exodus of God's people from their bondage in Egypt. In Exodus chapter 12, you'll read a great, great story where God delivers his people from their bondage down in Egypt. He raised up Moses. Moses was the man who would lead God's people out of Egypt. They'd been there for years in slavery, living in oppression, and God was now going to deliver them. Pharaoh, of course, initially refused to let them go. And God sent a series of 10 plagues for this man to consider the fact that God's people needed to leave and go and worship him. And then we discover after the death of the firstborn, as the angel of death visited every home in Egypt, God smote the firstborn in every Egyptian home. He spared his own people for the very reason that they obeyed God and they applied the blood to the doorposts of their homes. And God had said, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. That's the Passover sometimes referred to as the Feast of Unleavened Bread, Exodus 23 and 15. You'll discover also in 1 Corinthians 5, 7 and 8, this is for another time, but the Lord Jesus Christ speaks about Christ our Passover, the Lamb of God who was slain at Calvary and who shed his blood in order to deliver us from our sin. That's something we should never forget. Just as the Passover was to be celebrated, that's why we have the Lord's table to remind us of what Jesus did for us on the cross. He took our place, he died our death, he bore our punishment, he set us free. And as a Christian today, I trust you'll never, ever forget that because Jesus says, off the table, this do in remembrance of me. 
Secondly, we have Pentecost, and amongst the Hebrew-speaking people, this was also known as the Feast of Weeks, the Day of the First Fruits. You see, beloved, whenever in the Jewish calendar, Pentecost simply means the 50th, the 50th. It's called because it was celebrated on the 50th day after the presentation of the first harvest as sheaf of the barley harvest. That's the 50th day from the first Sunday after the Passover. So if Passover fell in the middle of April, Pentecost fell at the beginning of June. It was the best time for travelers to come together and to celebrate together. And that's why here at Pentecost, there were so many different people, so many different nationalities that were represented on that occasion. The Passover, Pentecost, the Feast of Tabernacles. This was associated with the ingathering of fruits. The people would look back, they'd remember God's provision for them in their wilderness journey. God had been faithful to them. And if you want to know more about that, take a look at Leviticus 23. So we need to understand what the day of Pentecost was. Here's the second thing. We need to understand the people who were involved. I say that because there's some disagreement about who was actually there on the day of of Pentecost. Well, the Bible says they were all with one accord in one place. Does that mean the 11 disciples plus Matthias, who had just been chosen to replace Judas Iscariot? Or does it represent the 120 who met together in the upper room? Well, I'm of the opinion they were all there. They were all there. Not just the disciples who had been close to Jesus, but the women and others who met in the upper room to pray. This was a significant day when the Spirit would come. This was to be the birth of the church. To include some and not them all would not be right. Since it was the whole group who were told to wait in Jerusalem until the bestowal of the Holy Spirit, these were the same people who were there on that occasion. The meaning of Pentecost. Here's the second thing. The manifestation of the Spirit. Look at what we read. Verse 2 to 4. Because this is something we all need to understand. Look at verse 2. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven. As of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the house. Where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now these verses have gripped the imagination of so many people. And they have led to great confusion in the spiritual realm. And the reason for that is simple. Too many people become obsessed by the symbols and they don't understand the significance of the day of Pentecost. So let me try and break this down for a moment and talk about both the symbols and the significance of these mysterious events. Firstly, we need to note the symbols associated with the event. This was a unique event. There's no doubt that it was a very special occasion where they received what the Lord Jesus Christ had promised to them before his ascension back to heaven. It was special in the sense that we should not expect another Pentecost any more than you and I should expect another Calvary. It was unique. Now, I'm not suggesting we should not expect a movement of God and a breath from heaven where the Holy Spirit moves across a land, across a church, across a continent. That has happened many times in the past. Would to God it would happen again. I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is this. This was a special occasion. This was the very occasion when the Lord Jesus Christ had promised them 
of the advent of the Spirit before he ascended back to heaven. What were the symbols? What did they signify? Well, you'll note there were two. There was the wind, a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. We have the tongues. It says there appeared there unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each one of them. What did they mean? What did they mean to the people who were gathered that day in Jerusalem who had come and were awaiting the advent of the Spirit? What did it mean to them then in the context of Acts chapter 2? Well, firstly, we have the wind. It's described here as a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. Now, you have to note here, because it's important, they heard the sound of a rushing mighty wind. And the sound came not only suddenly, but its origin was heaven. This was a supernatural act that was caused by God himself. And the wind was to symbolize the Spirit of God and to announce that the Spirit had come just as Jesus had promised he would come. You say to me, but how can you be sure that that's what we're talking about? Well, think of two other examples in the Word of God. Supernatural acts that are associated with wind. For example, think of Ezekiel for a moment, Ezekiel 37. We read about a valley of dry bones. And by divine, divine command, God told Ezekiel to prophesy to the wind to blow. And it was the breath of God that breathed upon those dead bodies and filled them with new life. Think of John chapter 3. Think of the Lord Jesus Christ with Nicodemus. The wind was Christ's chosen symbol of the pouring forth of the Holy Spirit. And he used that symbol in John 3 in his conversation with Nicodemus, who was a ruler of the Jews, a man who knew the Scriptures vaguely. Jesus said this to him concerning the new birth. The wind blows where it listeth, or where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but you cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. The Spirit of God can work suddenly. At times it works silently. And although we don't know when or where, we can see the evidence of the Spirit of God at work. You say to me, where? in the lives and hearts of people. There are many of us sitting here today and we're not what we once were. Why? Because we were reached by grace and born again of the Spirit of God. And that self-same Spirit who awakened us, enlightened us, and brought us to Christ has come to reside within the heart of every single believer in Christ. The Spirit of God can work suddenly. We don't know where. We don't know when. You see, that's why I have a problem whenever people sit together in a room and they meet and they're putting it across Facebook and other places that there's going to be a revival on Thursday night. How do you know? If God sends it and the Spirit brings it, how do you know? This is something that God does. God sends the breath from heaven as it pleases him. Revival is not something that can be whipped up in a room of 10 people praying. It has to be sent down. I'm not saying we shouldn't pray. But I am saying this morning that when we pray, we should pray earnestly and wait on God to send the movement of his spirit that we long to see. We have the wind described as a sound from heaven. 
as of a rushing mighty wind with the tongues. Because it says here, there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire. And it set upon each of them. What does that tell me? Well, it says that the outward manifestation of the Spirit's advent was visual as well as audible. The wind was heard and the tongues were seen. There appeared to them tongues as of fire. Now, that's hard to explain in our situation, let alone understand it. But in Scripture, fire is associated closely with the divine presence. Think of Moses. Here he is down in Midian doing what he has done for years. He's there on his own. And all of a sudden he sees a bush away from him and it's burning. Well, it's not actually burning because the burning was within, the bush was there. And through the burning bush, God spoke to Moses and God called Moses and he says, Moses, I want you to go to Egypt and deliver my people from their bondage. And throughout the scriptures, it is associated with divine presence. It gives light, it gives heat, it gives purity. Isn't that part of the Holy Spirit's work in our world today? He is to enlighten the minds of those who believe not. He inflames or warms our hearts with love for Christ and he purifies us so that we are fit and meek for the master's use. So we note the symbols associated with this event. We want to note secondly the significance of this event. Verse 4. We read here that they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, whatever our understanding of the symbols, there is no doubting whatsoever what the disciples experienced on this occasion. And I want to say this, they all experienced it. They all experienced it. Child of God today, if you feel at times that you're not like everybody else in the sense they can do this, they can do that, they can do the other thing. And you feel at times that you're useless and you have nothing to contribute. Let me tell you this, you're every bit as special to God as others. And you're every bit needed by God as others. Please do never put pastors, missionaries, church leaders on a pedestal. They're just the same as you but they do different things. They were all filled with the Spirit, it says. And what John the Baptist had foretold regarding a spiritual baptism, what the Lord Jesus promised in Acts 1, 4, and 5 before he left them, this was now their experience. They were all baptized by the Holy Spirit. And let's be clear that that is a once-for-all experience for them and for all of us. There is nowhere we're told to ask to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. We already have been baptized with the Holy Spirit. And according to Paul in 1 Corinthians 12, for by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body. There's one baptism of the Spirit. It's a once for all experience for the believer's in Christ, the Spirit of God unites us to Christ, places us within his body, and we're a fellow heir of him to eternal life. But we're also told here, they were all filled with the Spirit. And the interesting thing as we journey through the Acts of the Apostles is this that the experience of the filling of the Spirit happened on many different occasions. So whilst there is only one baptism of the Spirit, there are many fillings. 
Remember what Paul says in Romans or Ephesians chapter 5, 18, which is a book we've been through together in Bible study. Paul says to every believer, be filled with the Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. This filling of the Spirit is available to every believer. It's not for a chosen few. It's not for people that we conjure up in our minds or super spiritual sins. No, no, no. Paul says to the individual Christian, be filled with the Spirit. Those who were gathered together on the day of Pentecost, they were all filled with the Spirit. The see, problem is for many of us is this. Our realization of this experience depends on whether or not we live life in the Spirit as to whether or not we walk with the Spirit and as to whether or not we are under the Holy Spirit's control. You see, beloved, for some of us perhaps this morning, there are things in our lives maybe that we need to push out to make room for the Spirit of God to grip us and to change us and to make us what we need to be. If our lives are clogged with things, things of the world that lead us away from God, there's little chance that we're going to experience what it means to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And yet this is an experience that every Christian is encouraged to enjoy. I never thought much about this as a young Christian. Until one day I bought myself a book sitting in a bookshop and I took it down. It was a book by Jim Packer. Don't agree with everything Jim Packer says, by the way, in latter years, but I do know this. It was a great encouragement to me to know what it meant to walk in the Spirit. I'll tell you something. If I'm running around today as a believer and I'm displaying all the marks of an ungodly man, I'm not filled with the Spirit. If I'm running around as a professing Christian my life is not in sync with God's Word. And I'm not displaying the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And I'm not displaying those characteristics that set me apart as being something different from those around me in the world. I'm not living life in the Spirit. And in Paul's day, the people weren't filled with the Spirit. And he said to them, listen, and remember that in Paul's day, these people he speaks to, they were pagans who had been saved out of a pagan world. And there was a lot of confusion about what they used to be and what they needed to be. And Paul says, the only way you'll conquer that and become this is to be filled with the Spirit. And these people were all filled with the Spirit. And the significance of that is much more important than the symbols that we thought about previously. The symbols were important. They were necessary as a new day dawned, but far more significantly, and this is something they couldn't miss, and we mustn't miss it either. The Holy Spirit had come in power and empowered them to be the people that they needed to be. They would soon go out into a lost world to reach people for Christ. As Jesus had said to them, you're my witnesses. How would they do it? They wouldn't do it carrying a manual onto a doorstep and reading page 265. They'd do it in the power of the Spirit of God who not only empowered them but enabled them to turn their world upside down for Jesus. A new day was dawning. A new era had begun. A new purpose was unfolding. And a new power was enabling them to fulfill their commission. 
the meaning of Pentecost, the manifestation of the Spirit. Two, three minutes, the marveling of the crowd. Look at verse 5 to 7. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. And when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together, were confounded, because that every man heard them speak in his own language. They were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? So something marvelous had happened on the day of Pentecost when they were filled with the Spirit. These disciples had been transformed. You say, how do you know that? I'll tell you why. There are two things abundantly clear. They began to publicly praise God. And they began to personally speak about Christ. What a great example that is. Beloved, sometimes, and I used to work with people, and they might have said the same about me too. And they used to look at me and they would have said to me, you see, you Christians, you're the most miserable bunch of people I've ever seen looking at your face. Sometimes that might be true. But if you and I are filled with the Spirit today, we'll not be a miserable looking bunch of Christians. We'll be people who in every situation, even publicly, will praise God. And tell others about the wonderful works of God and that he is the God of creation. He is the God of salvation. The world outside who knows not Christ, they're teaching our children the very opposite. And we sit tight and we hope, well, my girl gets to 15 or my son gets to 16, they'll be able to defend it themselves. Don't wait till they're that age. Sit down with them. Open the word of God. Tell them about the wonderful God of creation, the God who can save them, the God who can keep them, and the God, as we were reminded this morning, who is with them in every situation of life. Something dramatic had happened. And they were speaking distinctively and they were praising distinctively. But the important thing is, it says in the language of the people who were gathered in Jerusalem that day. Now those people they ministered to, you must remember this. These men who gathered together were devout Jews. Devout men, they'd never seen anything like this before. Because they had an organized religion. And that organized religion dealt with feasts and fasting and long faces and rules and regulations. The witness and the worship of these believers amazed them. Absolutely amazed them. And what amazed them even more Every man heard them speak in his own language. Didn't matter where they were from, what art or part, these men were speaking in the dialect of the people that they were speaking to. You want to argue with me about tongues for today? You're not going to find it in Acts 2. And in Acts 2 and in Acts 10 and in Acts 19, the same word is used as the normal Greek word that is used from where you and I derive the word dialect. And they heard them in their own language. And they saw them as they publicly proclaimed their God. And they listened to them as they told them about Jesus. I said, any wonder there were 3,000 souls saved that day? God did it, and he did it through his people, ordinary men and women filled with the Holy Spirit and with power. And yet this was only the beginning. The day of Pentecost was a marvelous day. 
the Holy Spirit had come, manifested his power. The disciples were filled with the Holy Spirit. They had renewed boldness and enthusiasm to begin the work of evangelism. And the people who gathered that day were amazed. 3,000 were saved. But this was only the beginning. You and I are going step to step in next week, God willing, to a sermon that the Apostle Peter preached on that day. And if it doesn't shake us to our boots, I'm not sure what will. The day of Pentecost had come. What a day. What a glorious day it was. Let's pray before we sing. Father, how we would long and play and plead that the Spirit of God would come down in mighty power amongst us people in every church this morning. For sometimes, our Father, we're dead and sometimes we've lost our vision. Sometimes we don't live life in the Spirit. And Father, all around us there are people who want to see Christ in us. And they want to hear about the love of Christ from us. So grant, O God, that you might take each one of our lives, that you might breathe on them, that you might change us, and that we might know what it is to live life in the Spirit. Thank you for your word today, challenging though it is. We bless you for the written word of God. Make it real to our experience, we humbly pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's sing this hymn together as we close. Breathe on me, breath of God. Fill me with life anew. in the quietness of these moments. Breathe on us, we pray. Enlighten some that they might trust the Savior. Breathe on all of us who know and love the Lord that we might know what it is to live life in the fullness of the Spirit. Thank you for our time together. Thank you for everyone who has been able to join us. 
We pray that for those who leave us now, you'll take them safely home for those of us who wait around the Lord's table. Father, that you'll bless our hearts. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.